Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HDSA and Me, a virtual educational series for the HD community. Today, we welcome the team from our HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Rochester, Dr. Frederick Marshall, Amy Cheshire, Renee Hetzler, and Judith Kennedy. They'll be talking with you today about strategies to thrive with HD during the pandemic. You can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit send. Your question will be answered at the end of the session. This presentation will be available in about a week on HDSA's YouTube channel. On December 10th, we'll be talking about caregivers' role in a telehealth visit. You can register for this session by going to hdsa.org backslash hdsa hyphen me. And now a little about our speakers. Dr. Fred Marshall attended Harvard Medical School and did his residency at the Harvard Longwood Neurological Training Program serving as chief resident prior to moving to Rochester. He is currently chief of geriatric neurology division and served as director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Rochester for many years. He remains committed to providing passionate and comprehensive clinical care in addition to conducting clinical trials to help those affected by HD and their families. Renee Hetzler received her doctor of physical therapy degree from Ithaca College. She is a board certified neurologic clinical specialist in physical therapy and treats patients with a variety of neurologic conditions in an outpatient setting. She's been working with the HDSA Center of Excellence for over a year and is passionate about helping patients and families improve their function and quality of life. Judith Kennedy is a senior speech language pathologist and associate in neurology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. She specializes in diagnosis and management of complex speech, language, voice, and swallowing disorders in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. In addition, she provides services to patients in need of augmentative communication devices. And last but not least is Amy Cheshire. Amy is a clinical social worker and researcher at the University of Rochester in the Department of Neurology, Movement Disorders Division. She's an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry, and she received a master's degree in social work and master's degree in gerontology from the University of Southern California. Amy is a trained marriage and family therapist providing clinical care to movement disorder patients and their families. And we are delighted to welcome all of you here today, and I'll now turn the broadcast over to Dr. Fred Marshall. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Deb, and thanks for joining us on the webinar. And for those of you who are gonna have a chance to perhaps view this as a recorded webinar, um, we appreciate your interest. And we wanna spend a little time today thinking about the uh, impact of the pandemic on uh, how we survive and thrive uh, uh, with, uh, you know, chronic disease, particularly Huntington's disease. Um, and I wanna just say my heart goes out to the more than I think 230,000 uh, American families who have lost a loved one from the pandemic. Um, so I don't really have any um, any disclosures to make. I'm actually not gonna be talking much about pathophysiology of the disease or Huntington's disease today. Instead, I really wanna talk about um, how we communicate with one another uh, in a way that is um, respectful and tends to kind of tone down rather than up the anxiety and the level of um, upset and anger that can sometimes bubble up uh, when we're living in uh, isolation with one another. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a picture of how I have um, sometimes appeared, although I want to just say uh, I really posed for this picture to just make the point of what it feels like sometimes to be a provider in the context of the COVID pandemic. I guess I will share that um, uh, I did have COVID myself. I was pretty sick for a time. I wasn't hospitalized, but I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. So try to be safe. Uh, and um, with that slide, I think next slide. Um, so I'll be basically addressing the importance of mindful communication during this time of isolation. And then um, I'll introduce Renee again when I'm done. So next slide. Uh, the first thing to say is that um, when I talk about socialization, I'm really talking primarily about conversation. The human brain's best form of exercise is talking to other human brains. 
Uh, you think about um, uh, neurodegenerative disease in general, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. We know from large-scale epidemiological studies that people who are isolated and um, alone and not communicating with other folks in their environment have a much higher rate of the development of dementia. I'm not saying that um, you can uh, guarantee that you're not going to have a dementia, even if you know you talk to people all the time. But there is an ep a clear epidemiological link between being socially isolated and the rate at which populations develop dementia. Probably uh, other than abstaining from alcohol and controlling cardiovascular risks from the point of view of Alzheimer's disease, for example, we know that socialization probably has a bigger impact than either diet or exercise, both of which are well known to be important in avoiding dementia. So it's really important to talk to other people as much as you can. And that's not true just of the HD patients, but caregivers, it's true of all of us. And having said that, it's hard to do that uh, during a COVID pandemic. So, you know, COVID-19 spreads in the air when we talk to one another, laugh, cough, sing, sneeze, or just breathe. I suspect I got my COVID in the elevator at my apartment building. I live on the 10th floor of an apartment building. It's a small elevator. You walk into an elevator without a mask on, you have no idea whether somebody sneezed moments earlier. So um, wear a mask not only for your own safety, but for other people's safety. Um, and even though it's hard for many of us to wear a mask, I think it's particularly hard for people with HD to wear a mask, but do the best you can. And um, just remember the virus spreads 20 times as easily indoors as it does outdoors. And we're going into a season of being indoors for many of us who live in the Northern part of the United States at least. Um, but it is always safer to be outside when you're socializing with other people and even safer still if you're outside wearing a mask at a safe distance. As many as 30% of people who are actively infectious with COVID-19 are asymptomatic, meaning they don't even know they're infectious. So even though you feel perfectly fine and the people around you look perfectly fine, it's quite possible that they could be carrying COVID and infecting you or you could be carrying COVID and infecting them. So keeping hands and surfaces sanitized as much as possible. These are all kind of things that we hopefully have learned over the last six months. I wanna switch from that kind of biological stuff now to really thinking more about how we communicate with one another and particularly how do we communicate with one another with what I call mindfulness or mindfully. Uh, I've been very interested in mindfulness um, and have made presentations at the HDSA meetings nationally on this for some time now and taught many of our residents and medical students and colleagues here in Rochester some techniques of mindfulness over the last 10 years or so. So I'm gonna um, be working from the work of a man named Gregory Kramer, who has written a book called Insight Dialogue, which is really a sort of almost a meditative approach to communicating with one another. And um, Kramer describes these six steps to mindful conversations. Uh, these are photographs that I've taken myself in and around Rochester. And the first step in any good mindful conversation is to just pause for a minute, hit the pause button, center in on yourself, really be focusing on being fully present, being here right now, and being aware of where you're at, both emotionally, but also physically, in terms of your thoughts as well, and physical sensations. So pausing is how we start. This is my dog, Rufus. Uh, the next step in mindful communication is once you've kind of paused and set the reset button to really relax into that, you know, letting everything be, inviting every part of your body to acknowledge what's tense and try to be aware of it at least and let it go and do that again and again and again. And again, always turning towards your own body with a sense of kindness and self-compassion. So relaxing. And then importantly, setting an intention to extend that kindness to your own body, to your own emotional state, to your own thought process in a relaxed fashion to the person that you're gonna have a conversation with. Right? So really a friendly attitude, not, not quite so fast on the slides, Joe, I'll tell you when to slow down, a friendly attitude to um, 
really staying engaged in an open-hearted way to the person that you're communicating with. Next slide. So um, then once you've gone through that preliminary process of relaxing and opening you know, to, um, to the person that you're going to be com communicating with, then really kind of trusting whatever it is that arises, right? Uh, have some confidence that whatever emerges in the conversation that you're going to have is what needs to emerge. Um, it's an improvisatory act fundamentally when we communicate with other people. So allowing the conversation to sort of form in the interaction without necessarily trying to overly control it or to manipulate it. That's a challenging thing for, for me as a physician when I'm on a tight time schedule and I've got patients scheduled every you know, half an hour or so to, to, to sort of have an open-hearted conversation with good communication at the same time that we know that there's a time limit. Um, and then um, listening as deeply as you can, really slowing down and honoring the words and feelings that other people are expressing. Um, and um, again, trying to intentionally introduce an attitude of kindness and compassion to what the other person is saying. So it's a quality of intention, really, an intention of listening deeply, non-judgment, and um, freeing yourself from your own personal agenda long enough to be able to hear what the other person is trying to say. And then finally, and uh, this will be my last slide, actually speaking what's true for you. I'm not asking people to be Pollyannas or to somehow gloss over what's painful, um, you know, what are sources of tension maybe interpersonal tension with the other person, but simply always checking what it is that you have to say against the, the, um, the standard of whether or not uh, it's going to be useful and appropriate. Is it, and I would add kind to this slide. So um, it's, it's very hard to always do that. But um, one of my most important mentors was Dr. Joint, the founder of our department. And he, he used to say to us, you can't always be right, but you can always be kind. I'm not sure actually that I can always be kind, but really express what you want to say with a sense of its usefulness for the listener and how appropriate it is, doing it with goodwill and without cruelty. So at the end of the day, that's my advice about how to survive interpersonally during a time of tension and close uh, isolation with your loved ones. And, um, I hope that that stands us all in good stead. I'll try to live into it myself. And I, with that, I'd like to just introduce Renee Hetzler, who's our physical therapist here in Rochester. Um, Renee? Thanks, Fred, for Dr. Marco. Um, I think that topic is very important and is often overlooked when we're discussing wellness for everyone. And what I'm gonna be talking about is a little bit different, but certainly ties in. So I'm gonna be talking about the role of exercise in supporting wellness. And um, Jill, you can go to the next slide. The eight dimensions of wellness are pictured here. So we have the, the physical dimension of wellness, which is most people, what they think of when we talk about physical therapy, but the other dimensions are also impacted by exercise. So there's the intellectual dimension, the emotional dimension, spiritual, environmental, financial, occupational, and social dimensions. And I think that one of the main messages I'd like people to understand is that exercise can be a avenue of improving your quality of life in all of these dimensions. So one of our sayings in the PT world is that movement is medicine. So we want to figure out exactly how to incorporate this for people in their lives and what dosage we need for exercise. There's been a lot of evidence about the benefits of exercise in the general population. This is a list from the CDC. But exercise has been shown to improve thinking, cognition, learning, and judgment, which falls under the intellectual dimension of wellness. It also improves mood and sleep while reducing the risk of in depression and anxiety. And I think these are huge issues in the Huntington's disease population, but also our general population as well. So that falls under our emotional dimension. And of course, the physical dimension, exercise can help with weight management, improving strength and physical function, improving aerobic capacity while reducing pain, 
slowing the loss of bone mineral density and reducing the risk of things that we don't want to happen like fractures, falling and chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes and certain types of cancers. For Huntington's disease, it has not been very well studied up to this point in, uh, in our scientific literature. There's some concern in Huntington's disease that exercise can cause um, some cardiovascular risk factors or potentially some damage to the musculoskeletal system because it is a, a hyperkinetic movement disorder. So we're getting a lot of extra movements. Some of these same concerns existed initially for some other neurodegenerative conditions such as ALS, Parkinson's, and MS. And they initially said, don't exercise if you have these conditions. But there's a wealth of evidence in those conditions that exercise is at the very least safe and if um, hopefully can slow the disease progression and maintain function longer. That evidence isn't quite borne out so far in the Huntington disease population, but there have been some studies conducted using exercise and looking at the different effects. There was a clinical practice guideline by Quinn et al, and it was published in February of this year. So it's pretty up to date. And they have found strong evidence that exercise can improve fitness, improve motor function and gait quality, and weaker evidence that it might improve balance, breathing function, memory, and some of those more social components such as self-confidence, independence, socialization, mood, and apathy. So I think that the uh, potential benefits of exercise right now are outweighing the potential risks for exercise. The guideline also included some more specific recommendations related to exercise. So they recommend moderate intensity aerobic exercise three times per week. And moderate intensity, how they measured this primarily in the studies was a heart rate max. So 55 to 90% heart rate max was the range that the studies used. Um, I don't usually recommend that patients take their heart rate. They can if they want to, but an easier way to determine moderate in intensity is just to use a simple subjective zero to 10 scale. So zero being you're not doing anything and 10 hardest thing you've ever done. I recommend you are somewhere around a four to six on that scale. Another way to tell that you're working at moderate intensity is that if you're doing some form of aerobic exercise, you should be able to talk to someone that's with you, but you shouldn't be able to sing a song because that takes a lot more energy. Examples of aerobic exercise are anything that's going to get your heart rate up and get your breathing working. So such activities include biking, walking, swimming, dancing, anything, you, anything in that realm. The guidelines also recommend upper extremity and lower extremity strength training three times per week. And they don't have specifics for how many sets and reps and how much weight to use um, because we don't have enough studies so far to give us those more specifics. But examples of these types of exercise are resistance bands or light weights or body weight exercises. And I think the most important thing to take away from the uh, studies through the body of literature that's available right now is that exercise was found to be safe. There was very few adverse events uh, found during the studies and they were not directly related to the exercise itself. My personal recommendations are that exercise should be enjoyable. If you are doing exercise or trying to do exercise that you don't like, it's very low chance that you're going to be successful. So I always leave it up to patients what they are interested in doing or willing to try that they might be able to keep up long-term. I also recommend considering something holistic such as Tai Chi or yoga, because that holds in that mindfulness component that helps with the mental health and mental fortitude. So some barriers to exercise that are pretty common in the literature are lack of motivation. That's a big one for people without Huntington's and people with Huntington's. Um, cognitive impairments can be a barrier as well as physical factors such as balance because we don't wanna be unsafe with our exercise. And then another barrier, which is especially true during the time of this pandemic is the access to equipment or knowledge or a space to exercise. Some facilitators to exercise include having a contact person. So that can be a, a friend, a family member, a caregiver, and it can be someone that ideally is exercising with you because that is much more motivating for most people than trying to do it on their own. Um, or they're just checking in on you or helping you get set up to, to exercise. 
individualized extra pro exercise programs are really important. One, for the motivation, but two, just to make sure that the dosage of exercise is the right amount of challenge. We don't want anything that's too hard and we don't want anything that is too easy and it's not going to be having enough benefit. Um, if you are able to have a, a challenging program, that's important. We want to maintain what you have and ideally improve your capabilities. And then group training is another facilitator to exercise because it has that social component and it improves adherence. However, that is much harder during the times of pandemic because most group classes are not offered right now. There are some across the country that are doing some virtual group training, but it's not quite the same as in person. So keeping that in mind, especially the, the access barrier, I have included here some resources that you can use to promote wellness at home. The one that I really like is doyogawithme.com. It has, I have no financial affiliation with them or anything, but I, I just like them. So they have a combination of free and subscriber only content and you can search for what you're looking for. So you can um, sort by how much time you have to do your exercise. You can search for what body, uh, body part you're interested in exercising that day. And it has yoga, Pilates and meditation. So lots of different things that you can find what you like. YouTube also has quite a bit of exercise videos on it. The only problem with YouTube is that um, they might be, most of them, too high level for most, most people to do, especially if they're just starting. And because there is so much content on there, it's a little bit hard to sort out what is appropriate for you. But if you are looking for things and you're willing to sit down and search and try a few things, it does have a little bit of everything for everyone. Another resource that I would recommend is the Insight Timer app that has uh, some guided meditations that you can do. And I also like the ACE Library of Exercises. So this is a database of exercises that you can search for depending on what body part you're looking for that day. And this is nice if you're someone that's willing to kind of build your own exercise routine for the day. But if you're looking for more guided resources, I would try the Do Yoga With Me or the, the YouTube. Um, so yes, the, my in conclusion, my final message is just that exercise really is important because movement is medicine and it can have benefits on all of our uh, dimensions of wellness to improve our quality of life. So with that, I will turn it over to Judith to talk about speech and swallowing. Uh, that was excellent, Renee. Um, really physical exercise, I think, has really come into its own within the last, uh, you know, five years. Um, and yes, we should all be exercising. The, the title of my presentation is Speech and Swallowing Management in Huntington's Disease During the Time of COVID-19 and Beyond. Um, but I mean, actually it is, uh, I should have added before COVID. So um, there aren't a lot of um, things that change in terms of what we do to manage these um, problems as a speech pathologist. Um, so I, I will, however, you know, add a few things that I think are, have changed in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in, the, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, unemployment, as you know, has soared um, and food insecurity is on the rise. Um, and there is a prediction in uh, 2021 that almost 50 million people are going to go to bed hungry. Um, and that includes 17 million children. So um, my, my plea is to ask people, um, are you getting food? Are you getting enough food? Who is doing your shopping for you? Um, ask family members, friends, neighbors. Um, it, it really is important. I asked a patient this morning, um, are you getting enough food? And yes, who is doing your shopping? Um, because we all have to, um, we all have to help each other. So um, 
I am going to just talk a little bit about uh, what we do in uh, speech pathology. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Glidens, um, a speech pathologist from Oklahoma State, has done a wonderful overview, which is on the um, uh, HDSA website. So for more information, that is where I'd go. Um, we know, however, that the majority of individuals with Huntington's disease will develop speech and communication difficulties and swallowing and inadequate nutritional issues as well. So we really want to get on top of that very quickly. Um, Korea, as you know, results in, in uncontrolled involuntary contractions of almost all the muscle groups in the body, um, affecting speaking, uh, voice, and also respiration. And all of those work together to really um, affect intelligibility and comprehensibility. Um, also, Korea affects swallowing. Um, rapid tongue movements, um, oftentimes there's a hyperextension of the head and neck, which affects the, the swallowing physiology. Uh, some individuals may eat too rapidly, uh, tachyphagia, or may put way too much into their mouth and really not be able to handle it. So um, uh, important to assess those. And then because of the, the movement, oftentimes boluses, uh, uh, food, boluses of food are not chewed adequately. So large pieces can actually go down into the, um, into the throat and can get stuck into the airway. So it's, it's something to be uh, certainly very concerned about. And I do um, also ask patients and families, uh, do you know how to do the Heimlich maneuver? And if they're not sure, uh, we have a little practice session. So next slide. Um, in any neurodegenerative disease, my, um, my goal is for people to be able to use natural speech for as long as possible. There is nothing, uh, there's no device, there is no um, communication board, there's nothing that will substitute for natural speech. It's the most efficient way we communicate. We open our mouth, uh, well, hopefully, um, we think before we open our mouth and then we, we say what we want. For many of these other augmentative communication strategies, it really takes time uh, to, to generate, to produce what people want to say. Um, and then for swallowing, um, we certainly want to assess the risk of aspiration um, because we know that the leading cause of death and individuals with Huntington's disease is, is actually aspiration pneumonia. So um, that is important, but probably as important. Um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on aspiration, but we want to prevent malnutrition and dehydration. Um, and so um, we certainly talk about that a lot in, in the Huntington's Clinic. And then what do we do? We manage some of these changes with uh, diet modifications and many other strategies as well. Next slide. Um, <laughs> communication. So this, this goes along with what uh, Dr. Marshall was, was talking about, what Renee was talking about. Communication is how we stay connected to our world. Um, when people can't understand what we're saying, um, we tend to back away. Uh, we tend to uh, 
perhaps not uh, talked as, as much and it can become, um, it really can become very difficult in terms of people just not wanting to communicate. It's a communication puts us in touch with others. Um, it certainly allows us to vent um, and it gives us the ability to control our environment, which is so important. Um, and it's much more than speaking. It really um, refers to all sorts of things like um, email, texting, gestures, uh, facial expressions. So, I mean, we talk about this as well um, when we're assessing communication. And this is a, um, a quote that I've had for probably 30 years that I, I really like very much. Um, and I think it says it all, deterioration of speech and the inability to communicate have the greatest negative impact on quality of life, self-esteem, and hope for the future. Um, next slide. And <laughs> one of my favorite photographs as well, um, two people I have great respect for, the late Anthony Bourdain and Barack Obama. Um, Food brings people together on many levels. It's nourishment of the soul and the body. Next slide. So in terms of management, um, there are some things that we can do when, and certainly we talk about this in the clinic. Um, I would recommend that people keep their scheduled follow-up um, in the office or uh, via telemedicine, and this is an, uh, just an aside, uh, but I do like telemedicine. COVID-19 has brought us all into, um, you know, I think um, a way of, of interacting with patients that, that really I hope continues because I think it's so much easier for so many patients uh, to do uh, telemedicine. I like telemedicine because I actually can see the individual now without a mask. And that to a speech pathologist is important. Um, I also love to see people in their natural habitat, um, what they use for drinking, uh, what they use for utensils and just eating. I always ask people to eat and swallow during the evaluation. I, I like to see how they do that. And it's very different in a, a clinic situation or in radiology. Uh, people don't uh, act naturally. Um, they're very cautious. Um, and then certainly weight maintenance. Um, there is a wonderful website, uh, The Geriatric Dietitian, and uh, they have uh, wonderful recipes, high calorie recipes um, that are made with everyday food and then suggestions to add in calories. And we know that uh, individuals with Huntington's disease, uh, many of them do need more calories and they may need to increase to 3,500 or 5,000. There is a recipe for the king of smoothies, uh, which comes in at 1,200 calories. And I think what's nice is that um, it's really a fairly inexpensive way to do it. Some of the uh, calorie supplements like Boost and Ensure um, they're only about 365 calories per can, but they're also expensive. Um, and then dental care, um, always focus on this. It's very important to get rid of the bacteria in the mouth uh, because that's an, uh, um, a cause of uh, pneumonia, um, especially if it gets into the lungs. 
Um, and our teeth are very important. So I encourage people to keep dental appointments and to certainly brush their teeth twice a day and floss. And then music and singing, we know how important that is in terms of uh, just sort of soothing the soul. And I love singing because it's a wonderful exercise for the voice, for breathing, um, and um, it just makes people happy. And then thank you, Renee, that was excellent um, physical exercise. And for speech and communication, I will often give people homework and I'll say, um, pick 10 phrases, 10 social phrases that you use every day to the people around you. Um, and then if you can record it, um, all our mobile phones have recording apps. Um, and then just to, to kind of get them into the uh, frame of mind to think about, you know, how, um, how they might improve their, um, their speech. And then thank you to Fred. Um, mindfulness, I think, is where it's at. Thank you. All right, I'm going to step in. Uh, thank you, Judith. That was wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't introduce you. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm blessed to work with such a great group of people. So, um, so I'm going to chat uh, here for a few minutes about kind of um, shifting gears a little bit, but it's all kind of part of what my colleagues have been talking about and kind of, um, I do like this quote though, in terms of your mental health, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. And I think certainly where we are at with COVID right now, um, this is something that's really important to keep in mind as we uh, slog through this. So this is um, a diagram that actually popped up pretty early on social media. And actually, um, I think our chairman showed it at a very early a meeting here as well. Uh, and it just gives you an idea that I'm kind of, these are different zones about sort of, um, where are you at right now in terms of just kind of dealing with COVID? And certainly in the early periods, there was so much of the fear going on and the uncertainty uh, and just, you know, a lot of uh, anxieties about a lot of basic things and a lot of more intense things. And my hope is, is that as people now, the months are going on, that we're hoping that folks are gradually kind of finding their way through the fear zone and hopefully kind of moving out into more kind of learning ways to sort of identify um, what's going on for them related directly to the pandemic. Um, and then hopefully, uh, maybe a little idealistic, but moving towards uh, finding kind of some sense of meaning in all of this. So more of this kind of growth zone uh, and really kind of working on your connection with others uh, and, and instead of all the resistance, um, starting to kind of more accept uh, sort of where things are at. So um, just to take an idea of kind of where you might be right now. So next slide. Uh, so I've kind of turned COVID into a little bit of a verb with uh, what I call COVIDness. Um, and this comes up at various times, uh, but I think a lot of, and this is what I hear from my HD folks in particular, um, is really this sense of feeling quite stuck uh, and really feeling at various times like um, there just isn't maybe uh, going to be a way out of this. Um, so I think really trying to continue to remind folks um, that we are hopeful there is going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, but trying to kind of hold space for where people are at with this um, is really important. So next slide. And a big thing that we talk a fair amount about with either caregivers or folks with HD, and really for all of us, um, is really trying to drill down. These are specific things around the issue of control uh, and things directly related to COVID. Um, so the outside there is all the many, and there are many more things that could be on this slide of all the things that are really out of our control in particular, 
what other people are doing, other people's actions, um, how people are reacting, the amount of toilet paper. I'm noticing that my own store is still pretty light on cleaning supplies. So, uh, but learning to really kind of let go of all those things that are really so much out of our control. And then really trying to focus more on these things in the middle here that hopefully for the most part um, should be in our control, whether we want to exercise that. And I know sometimes related to HD, um, this can be challenging, certainly for a lot of folks, depending on where they're at with their Huntington's. Um, but some of these things that um, are a little bit easier to have in our control um, is really important as, as the time is going on. In particular, I think the one around your attitude um, is really something, even into late stage Huntington's disease, um, sort of your attitude about things is hopefully something that people always feel like they can have some degree um, of control over, even when it feels like so many things maybe related to the progression of the disease are, are sort of out of their control. So next slide. Um, so the big issue that's really obviously and it's kind of been a thread through my other colleagues' talks is this issue around isolation and loneliness. Uh, and really now that we're what in our ninth month or so of the pandemic, what are, these are just some ideas around what people are trying to do to help manage this. Um, on the top left there, I'll give a big plug for uh, trying to get outdoors uh, a little bit. This is actually from our annual HD camp. Uh, and so it's a great picture on the uh, two people in the orange shirt are actually wearing our campers. Those are two HD campers and then a kind volunteer, uh, Emma on the right there. But trying to find any way to get outdoors, we just know can be super helpful. It doesn't have to be elaborate or long, um, but really can seem to help make a big difference in people's sense of um, just isolation and getting connected a little bit to the natural world uh, becomes super important. And obviously telemedicine, I thought, too, this did a great plug around um, some of the upsides of telemedicine. We had actually started to do telemedicine uh, here in the HD clinic um, before COVID um, set in, uh, really recognizing what a burden sometimes it can be to get into the clinic. Um, so that has obviously really taken off. And I think a lot of people are are finding some upside to that. I'll say that also I think a lot of our HD folks prefer to come in person and um, we've been glad to be able to, to be offering that to people as well. Um, so next slide, I guess I got to move along here. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to talk about some of the really common kind of in terms of mental health issues that are coming up. Um, and these are what some people are calling sort of the hidden sorrows. Um, that are going on. And I think this is getting a lot more press too, uh, now that we're so far into it. Um, so really keeping an eye on people's mental health and their depression and what we sometimes refer to the roommate of depression, which can be anxiety. Um, and the sense, what I hear in my support groups is this kind of Groundhog Day syndrome. Every day is starting to feel exactly like the same. So finding some creative ways to kind of build some uh, things that are less familiar into your day can help. And the other thing that doesn't get talked about, but um, I hear this also in my support group, is that some people feel guilty that they feel like they're actually doing okay during COVID. Uh, and uh, actually we had a discussion about this the other night in the support group um, that uh, some of the folks with HD now are having an easier time saying that they don't want to go out, um, you know, and being able to say, well, it's related to COVID. So um, just to keep in mind that for some folks, obviously a lot of people are suffering, but there are also people that um, are doing okay with it too. Um, some quick strategies. One of the best ways to help deal with anxiety is really, you know, trying to find any small way to help out somebody else. It's a good way to kind of get outside of yourself and it can just be whatever small technique that you're able to manage in any day or any week is wonderful. Uh, I won't, Fred did a great job with all the kind of different mindfulness techniques. I think we try to help people with just some simple 
breathing exercises. I know we do that in support groups sometimes. Um, just some really simple things that people can do at any point in their day uh, to try to kind of help calm down that sort of central nervous system. Really keeping connected during your providers, I think is even more critical during COVID. Uh, we want to hear from people. We get concerned when we're not hearing from people. Um, so to really know that we're there for you. So next slide. Um, these are just some, I talk about these a fair amount when I do talks, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of these kind of top 10 things to think about. Um, in particular, um, I think a number four here during this pandemic is kind of finding ways similar to what Renee was talking about, sort of figuring out your right dose of exercise. I think in terms of what we're finding with people's mental health is really figuring out what's the right amount of dose for your sort of news and TV watching. I know sometimes, especially with disease progression, folks might be spending a lot more time watching television. So I think to really be aware of, uh, you know, what, what is a good amount for you and what seems to be crossing over and, and really causing you more anxiety and angst. Um, hunger and boredom, I always say, are two things that tend to get folks with HD into trouble. Uh, so finding ways to attend to either of those um, can be super important for everybody's sort of quality of life. Um, and I think trying to, um, number eight, always is a good point to drive home that I wish the person with HD could do the changing, but as my longtime HD colleague, Jimmy Poller would say, their plate is just too full trying to cope with Huntington's every day. So I'm afraid it's up to the rest of us to try to figure out environmental ways, our own caregiving, our own ability to be with people uh, that we have to kind of figure out and be creative with doing the changings and, and the adjustment and not expecting the person with HD to be able to do that. And uh, another, another longtime colleague, Jane Paulson, uh, always used this when she was asked a lot about behavioral things and is this person just trying to be difficult during this time? And she would often give this response, you know, when you're in doubt, it's always better to err on the side of empathy. So super important to keep in mind. So next slide. So this is a plug for, uh, this is a little bit older picture, but uh, taken at HDSA convention, I don't remember where. Uh, these are uh, all the HDSA um, social workers across the country that were there. Um, and just another plug that Marjorie Guthrie, uh, who was the wife of Woody Guthrie, uh, you know, when she was in the throes of trying to take care of Woody with HD, was asked by a longtime nurse, Carol Moskowitz, down at Columbia University, you know, what, what can we do to help HD families? And Marjorie had a very simple response, which was to pick up the phone. And so um, I really always try to, uh, all our colleagues here, the social workers, I think try to be very aware um, of that we're here for you and we want people to keep reaching out to us so we can keep picking up the phone and being here for you. So next slide. So these are just some final thoughts. Um, we've talked a lot about most of these. Um, and again, I think um, trying to keep in contact with your health tech team is really important. Getting control of the things you can, eating good food like Judith was talking about. Hopefully our people are having access to food and trying to keep those connections and being super compassionate and kind to ourselves. Um, again, it's just really critical during this time. So next slide. This is a great poem that actually um, our chairman, Dr. Holloway, shared in the early months at COVID that was written anonymously. So um, I just thought it might be a, a great way to wrap up. Remember to be a bit more patient, a bit kinder, a bit more loving, and a bit more understanding because we're all in this together. I cannot get through this without you, nor you me. So I offer you my hand to help, my ear to listen, my shoulder to cry upon, and my arms to share your load. If I complain today, please do not mark me as a complainer. I just haven't found someone to ease my load. If I seem impatient, please be patient with me. I'm just tired and self-care is difficult when so many rely upon you. Please don't look at my shortcomings, but instead look at my potential. I'm loaded with it. We are needy. We need laughter, joy, family, comfort, friends, peace, and love. 
And bottom line, we need each other. Again, having Huntington's is it's just really hard work. So next slide. So these are some uh, resources, and I think due to time, I probably won't go too much into them, but HGSA has a number of wonderful resources, great online support groups, a great way to keep that connection going, uh, great te free telehealth sessions uh, with a mental health therapist uh, is another one. If you're in New York, I put a plug in here for the New York Project Hope, where you can get a lot of free support. Um, HD BuzzNet has a number of great articles as well, um, and there's a couple of podcasts uh, as well um, that have some great additional kind of options for folks. So I think that's it for me. So I think we're going to, next slide, I think we're going to move into questions now. So I'm going to start off. Um, Looks like I could direct this to Fred. Um, how can caregivers incorporate mindfulness on a regular basis? So thanks, Amy. I'll just say there's a thousand ways to, um, to behave mindfully or to cultivate your own mindfulness. And for caregivers, I think it's important to just acknowledge that you're trying to incorporate mindfulness into your own life as a caregiver and hopefully trying to facilitate uh, your loved one's ability to incorporate mindfulness into their life. So there's some really easy things to do. The first is to not put mindfulness on a pedestal, to not think of it as something that's unattainable or you have to be a, you know, a, a monk somewhere in the wilderness, you know, uh, in isolation, uh, meditating all day, right? Um, probably one of the most useful things that somebody taught me is that when I'm in the car and I reach a red light, think of it as a gift. Think of it as a period of time when, uh, whether you like it or not, all you can really do is be with yourself, be with your thoughts, maybe take some nice, deep, soothing breaths and understand that this is one little thing that's beyond your control, unless you're willing to get a ticket and run the red light, right? So don't rev up at a red light, slow down, mm -hmm. right? Stop take a break, take a little breather, right? little things like that. And I think probably the most important thing I could advocate is find as many moments as you can in the present to be grateful, which requires a kind of quality of noticing, noticing something that's beautiful, noticing something that's kind, uh, just taking a moment to try to get in touch with um, some aspect of the person that you're with that you really, really uh, love or that you admire. Um, I think I'm not saying always live in the present, it's okay to think about the past, but when you think about the past, don't indulge yourself in ruminations about what didn't work. Think about things that are happy. And when you think about the future, think about it as a way of setting an intention for yourself. Try to visualize something happy in your future. Try to visualize some place of peace or restfulness or contentment. There are um, some wonderful resources. I think Renee um, mentioned an app that I happen to have on my phone. Um, it's um, it's called Insight Meditation. And if you go, I think it's you know it's not an expensive app to get. Um, you can um, you can uh, listen to literally thousands of archived mindfulness meditations that are guided. One nice thing to think about doing is just starting slow, you know, curving out five minutes for yourself, maybe in the morning when you can just sit silently and really focus on your breath. So those are some quick ways that are easy. The most important though, don't make a big deal of it. It's not a big deal. It's a, it's, um, it's sort of a lifestyle. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and Judith, this would probably be for you. It's um, a couple, it's actually a little bit of a two-part. Um, when should a family seek a swallowing evaluation? And then what are the, what are kind of the signs that families should be aware of that swallowing is maybe getting more difficult? Um, well, I think it's important, obviously, to take your cues from the individual. I. Um, if the, if the individual with HD is struggling, I mean, just to even get, you know, the food down, 
Um, obviously, coughing and choking are the sort of the cardinal signs, but um, it, it's, I, I also go by just what the individual reports. Um, and, you know, just spending a lot of time, prolonged meal times, trying to get the food in, um, those are certainly indications. Um, certainly the, the signs, some of those would be the, the signs or symptoms. Um, sometimes people have difficulty managing their secretions. Sometimes what you'll hear after somebody swallows food or liquid is actually a change in their, their voice quality. So, so that's also a sign. Um, and, and definitely weight loss, even though we're not always sure why people with Huntington's lose weight. Is it because of the swallowing problem or is it because of the increased um, energy requirements um, because of the movement disorder or maybe something that we don't even understand um, at this point. But um, if, if you have any, you know, um, any questions about it and are con considering it, I would just I would go to your physician and, and ask for a referral. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Renee, any suggestions um, for uh, folks that are kind of dealing with apathy and uh, maybe are therefore not too interested in uh, kind of getting off the couch and uh, getting their heart going a little bit? Any other additional tips or suggestions? Yes, um, that is a very common problem. And my, my best advice is really just to figure out what someone is interested in and meeting them where they're at. So every program should be highly individualized. Sometimes I'm talking to patients about a running program and sometimes I'm talking about, can we get up and walk every commercial break to just to the other room and back? Um, but I, one of the things that I have had some success with is incorporating um, video game systems or um, virtual reality type systems that involve movement because those are a lot more engaging and more fun ways to move for people that don't have the motivation, the inherent motivation to exercise. So um, it doesn't always work, but it's something to consider if it's, if it's appealing to the person. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think we will probably wrap up. Is, is We're almost at three o'clock. Um, is that correct, Deb? Yes, uh, thank okay. you very much. Um, we do want to thank uh, our members of the HGSA Center of Excellence at the University of Rochester for this really fantastic presentation that they've done today. Um, if you want to refer back to any of the resources that they have included in their presentation. Um, the, uh, this will be available on HGSA's YouTube channel in about a week and you'll be able to, to find those. Um, also, Jill Lowell was kind enough to provide her email address um, if you have any additional questions for the team at Rochester. So again, thanks again to uh, Dr. Marshall, uh, Renee, Amy, Judith, and Jill for um, coming together today to spend some time with us. And I'd like to remind everyone that our final HGSA and me uh, for 2020 will take place on December 10th. And we'll be talking about the role of the caregiver in a telehealth visit. So until then, take care, stay safe, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having Bye -bye. us. Thank you.